Uh, well, thank you very much indeed for uh, turning up again. Uh, I had a horrible feeling that I might just be wasting my sweetness on the desert air this afternoon because you've all decided you want a nice restful Sunday afternoon. Uh, well, as Alan says, um, this afternoon <coughs> I'm wanting to try to identify some of the possible connections that there might be uh, between the Low Countries uh, and Scotland. Uh, in talking about the Low Countries, I'm referring, of course, both to modern Holland and uh, modern Belgium. Um, in previous uh, talks in this series, I, I've looked at possible links with England. I've looked at uh, the extent to which uh, Masons may have looked back to the past in Scotland, to the cross-fertilization of ideas uh, with um, secular architecture. Uh, I looked at France yesterday. But I have to say my own feeling is that uh, links with, lo with the Low Countries may have had a, a particular significance and I do think there are quite a lot of uh, ideas that we see being developed in the later medieval architecture in Scotland that have an ultimate source in the Low Countries. But, of course, I must stress that we're not dealing with absolute certainties uh, in this. Oh, my word, if only we were, it would be uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, because, of course, Masons, well, and patrons neither, didn't sit down and write where they'd taken their ideas. So it's a question, really, uh, perhaps of assessing not even balance of probabilities, uh, so much as balance of possibilities. And I would say, uh, in fact, with the talk that I'm giving this afternoon, I'm topping and tailing my comparisons with two that perhaps I'm not quite able to convince myself uh, about yet. The ones in the middle, the sort of meat in the sandwich, I do have slightly greater conviction for. So if I start muttering at the beginning and the end of the talk, you'll know that I'm getting a bit uh, nervous about what I'm putting before you. Well, let's look at some of the historical background to the links with the Low Countries. Um, just to uh, itemize some of the uh, significant areas where there could be linkage. Uh, what we do have to remember, of course, is that the Low Countries were, in the later Middle Ages, and in fact for some time before then, uh, Scotland's principal trading partner, uh, with the staple based most of the time at Bruges, uh, with, of course, its port at uh, Dama. Um, but the re relationship with, Bru with Bruges wasn't uh, an entirely easy one. Uh, there were quite often uh, periods of dispute, and in 1347, the staple was established at Middleburg uh, after Scottish goods in Flanders had been seized. Uh, in 1427, it uh, returned to Bruges. Uh, something that's perhaps worth mentioning is that in 1444, uh, Princess Mary married the Lord of Camp Vera, and the staple was moved for a while to Vera, where those, those of you who've been there, uh, you'll, what you will remember about Vera is that it's an absolutely splendid uh, chip shop on the harbour. Uh, but right next to that chip shop, there are two houses known as the Scottish Houses, uh, which are supposed to be uh, where Scottish merchants were based. Uh, another connection with the Low Countries, in 1449, James II married the Duke of Gelder's daughter. And uh, I talked yesterday about the church that she arranged to be built, um, Trinity College in Edinburgh, for prayers to be offered for her uh, husband, James II. In 1469, trade again went back to Bruges, uh, but that was a fairly short uh, period at Bruges. Uh, and the decision was dis made to move the staple back to uh, Middleburg. But it's Interesting that obviously the trade with Scotland was something that was clearly thought worth cultivating uh, because uh, as late as 1539, Antwerp made a bid for the Scottish uh, staple, uh, which at that time was uh, apparently at Vera. So we've got all of these places uh, with which uh, Scotland has close trading relationships. And I think it would be a mistake just to limit ourselves to looking at those places, because uh, certainly looking at the architectural evidence, I hope I might be able to, uh, well, I hope I might be able to convince myself, and if I'm able to convince me, if I'm able to go on and convince you, that there are links rather further afield within the Low Countries. It wasn't simply uh, limited to those uh, fields. Well, this is a map that uh, Alexander Stevenson uh, put together, for the uh, book on the Scottish medieval town, uh, which points out some of the places that I've been talking about. There's Bruges, of course, down at the bottom with its port at uh, Dama. Uh, there's Vera, and there's uh, Middleburg. Um, 
I also want you to take note of Dordrecht because I'll be um, mentioning that as well. And take note that this is Brabant here, the, the Duchy of Brabant, which was much more accessible from the sea uh, at this time than it is now because, of course, uh, there were waterways going right up to the uh, coast of Brabant at the time that we're talking about. And I think there are also uh, architectural links further north uh, within the, uh, the county of Holland that uh, we have to bear in mind. Um, one other thing to show you, this uh, rather splendid map uh, put together by Michael Lynch and Alexander Stevenson for the Atlas of Scottish History, which reminds us um, very graphically about the extent and importance of Scottish uh, overseas trade uh, based on the customs returns between 1327 and 1599, where you can see very clearly that the, uh, all of the Scottish trading ports were on this uh, east coast. Uh, you know, we've got Aberdeen there, Dundee, uh, Perth, uh, Edinburgh, Haddington, uh, and several others as well, all carrying out a very uh, active trade uh, with mainland Europe and particularly with the Low Countries. Uh, do bear in mind that this here ought to be over on this side because, of course, this is Edinburgh, but Edinburgh by this stage had become just so overwhelmingly important uh, for trade uh, that uh, poor Michael and Alexander obviously couldn't uh, find any way of attaching it to Edinburgh just there. So in your minds, move that eastwards and you'll realise just how important the eastern seaboard was uh, for, uh, for trade. Um, well, what other connections can we bear in mind? Uh, let's remember that Andrew Halliburton was operating from Middleburg um, in the late 15th and early 16th century. He was the conservator of Scottish privileges in the Netherlands, and much of his correspondence has uh, survived. And that gives us a, a tremendous insight into the sorts of things that um, people in Scotland were buying from the Netherlands. Uh, and it really was a quite extraordinary range of things uh, needless to say, it includes uh, well, things like church furnishings, which I'll say a little bit more about uh, fairly soon, because the church furnishings that were produced in the Netherlands were especially highly valued, uh, really pretty much throughout the Western world, and that includes uh, Italy. Um, it was also a good place, if you were in the mind, uh, to buy a tombstone for yourself. It was quite a good place to, to buy that. And we even get uh, purchasers, Bishop um, William El Elphinston of Aberdeen, was buying gunpowder and wheelbarrows at the time that he was uh, starting preparations for building King's College Chapel. Uh, why he needed gunpowder, I'm not quite sure. Uh, why he couldn't buy his wheelbarrows, well, um, I suppose they weren't do-it-yourself stores at the time, but I would have thought there were people producing wheelbarrows in Scotland perfectly satisfactorily, but you know, it just gives you a, a very graphic illustration of uh, just how important uh, purchases from the Netherlands were. Um, we also have to remember that there was a resident community of Scots, uh, particularly in Bruges, and several churches, uh, one of which I'll be talking about a little bit uh, later on, did have chapels uh, or altars that were particularly associated with the Scottish uh, community. Uh, probably one of the most important of those was the Church of uh, St Giles, uh, which contained altars for the Scottish porters in the South Nave Isle and also the Scottish brokers in the North Isle. Uh, and I think that is quite significant because I do think we see architectural elements in St Giles that may well have been copied in Scotland. Uh, and we also know the Carmelite Church, um, the Scottish fraternity, added um, a South Chapel which was dedicated, as you might expect, to uh, St Ninian. So you know, the, the Scottish presence in Bruges was very important indeed. And let's also remember that uh, at a time uh, when um, Scotland either didn't have universities at all or the universities were in a very early stage of development, an awful lot of people who were looking for advancement in the church uh, went to, uh, at a time when it wasn't a good idea to go to an English university, were going to continental universities. And the university at uh, Leuven or Louvain um, educated a lot of people who were to rise to dizzy heights in the Scottish Church. I've just listed a few of them here. Uh, Bishop James Kennedy of St Andrews. Uh, we saw his St Salvatore's Chapel uh, uh, yesterday. Bishop William Turnbull of Glasgow, who was very active in uh, the University of Glasgow. 
uh, Archbishop William Shevers of St. Andrews, who was one of the earliest uh, patrons of uh, classical art uh, in Scotland. And of course, Archbishop Robert Blackadder of Glasgow. Uh, and I showed you some of the work that he carried out at uh, Glasgow Cathedral yesterday. So all of these people would have been very well aware, not just of Lurton, uh, but of areas around there. It's almost certain they did quite a lot of uh, traveling. Uh, and I've already talked about the sort of works of art that were uh, produced in the Netherlands for Scottish consumption. Uh, one of the most interesting of those, of course, was the uh, purchase of the choir stalls for Melrose Abbey. This was at a phase when Melrose, well, it had gone through its uh, English phase, its French phase. It was sort of partly in its Scottish phase, but it's got the sort of Netherlandish sub-phase. Um, and we know that it was, must have been in about 1433 that the stalls were uh, ordered from the Netherlands. And it was a very specific contract because there was a lawsuit because Cornelius van Elt, who was really leader of the, um, of, of the uh, woodworkers in Bruges, um, had to justify why he hadn't produced the stalls when he was supposed to. Poor chap had had all sorts of problems. And in the end, he was just too frightened to come to Scotland. And it wasn't until agreement was reached that he really wouldn't be lynched that he was able to come uh, across and fit them. Uh, but it was a very specific contract, as I say, and uh, it did specify that the stalls would be, be based on those in the Cistercian Abbey churches at Tenduinen and Terdost. I assume there is probably uh, Cornelius who suggested these, but it does suggest that the monks of Melrose would have been sufficiently aware of what it was that they were asking for. I assume that the stalls would probably have looked uh, something like the stalls that you see in the Church of St. Salvator in Bruges, which is now the cathedral, of course. Uh, these date probably from the second quarter of the 15th century. Um, but I think uh, it is likely that it's something like this that would have been expected. It is rather galling that, of course, we do still have the traces of the dwarf wall uh, between that's actually built into the arcade piers within the area of the monastic choir at Melrose, against which the stalls would have been set. Uh, and it is quite interesting that they only rise up to this height. And so it does leave you wondering if there were going to be canopies above the stalls or, or not. Uh, perhaps it was part of the uh, residual Cistercian rigour that they were prepared to put up with the drafts rather than have the, the backboards and the canopies above them. But uh, try to imagine something of that inside the choir. And it, it, may, it does help to understand just what Melrose must have looked like. And of course, we all know uh, the most magnificent thing that was bought from the Low Countries for a Scottish site. Uh, this is uh, two sides of the wings of what was presumably a triptych uh, altarpiece that was ordered for uh, Trinity College Church in the 1470s by Hugo van der Hoes. Um, and it is um, really a, a very, very important piece of work. This is this simply isn't shop quality work that's been uh, bought in. This is something that's being uh, specially commissioned for a very important church under royal patronage. So, you know, that reminds us of the sort of quality of stuff that might be coming in. It's probable that quite a lot of stuff was shop quality. Um, I don't know if any of you know Christa Grossinger's lovely book on uh, Northern European altarpieces uh, that survive in England. Uh, and it's obvious from that that, you know, quite often, rather second-rate stuff was uh, sent off to foreign shores. Uh, but certainly that was not the case with the Van der Hoes uh, altarpiece for Trinity College. Of course, another lovely thing that uh, still survives from this um, purchase of um, church goods from the Netherlands is the Book of Hours of James IV and Margaret Tudor. Uh, I've already shown you uh, pictures of this, but uh, here again are the pictures of James IV kneeling before the altarpiece with the image of uh, Christ as Salvator Mundi, uh, Saviour of the World. Uh, and there's the, uh, his queen uh, on the other side, kneeling before the uh, virgin. But I hope I'd also uh, show you the picture of the um, funeral mass. Sorry, it's not a funeral mass. It's a funeral service that's taking place over the coffin, presumably, of um, in anticipation of the uh, funeral of James IV himself. And you'll see the royal uh, arms on the flags hanging around there. I imagine that cheered him up no end, seeing that sort of thing every time he uh, opened his uh, service book. But you know, this is a reminder uh, of what 
uh, the collegiate churches that we've been talking about were founded for. You know, their main function was to pray for the salvation of the people who founded them. And that's a wonderfully graphic uh, illustration of just what happened when that took place. Just thought I'd remind you of one other work of art that uh, is assumed to have been in Scotland. Um, do think away those uh, rather naff crowns that have been put on the virgin and child. But the story behind, this is a, a, a virgin and child that's now in uh, Notre Dame de Finistère in uh, Brussels. Uh, and obviously a very valued uh, image. Um, the assumption is that it was made in the Netherlands and then imported to Aberdeen. Uh, but then at the Reformation, it was taken back again to uh, the Netherlands and uh, it ended up in the Church of Notre Dame in uh, Brussels. You know, and again, this is a pretty high quality piece of work, uh, another reminder of the sorts of things that were uh, being brought in. Uh, but for those of you who want to follow uh, this sort of purchase of um, foreign um, works, ecclesiastical works of art, Obviously, well, those of you who don't know it already, I must uh, recommend uh, Stephen Holmes' uh, splendid uh, edition of David McRoberts' uh, Rhind Lectures on Medieval Church Interiors, which has been published as uh, Lost Interiors, and it gives you an enormous amount of information on many of these uh, imports. Well, we've seen that in the case of Cornelius van Eert, he was prepared to come across to Scotland to uh, fit the stores that he'd made, uh, so long as they were promising not to duff him up when he got there. Uh, but there do seem to be other cases where uh, foreign craftsmen uh, came over. And I think uh, the statues that survive on the south side of the chapel at Falcon Palace in Fife are probably an example of this. Um, we do have the documentation which says that uh, somebody called Peter Flemisman was paid £15 pounds for hewing of five great stain images to be set upon the five buttresses on the south side of the new chapel. Uh, and some of these survive in a very eroded state now, of course. Here are, are two of them. Um, despite the fact that they're so eroded, um, you can see that they have been pretty high quality work. And I think the name Peter Flemisman uh, probably leaves not an awful lot of room for doubt that it was somebody from the uh, Low Countries who'd come over to carve these. And I think there probably were rather more cases of these than there's uh, documentation to uh, indicate. Uh, and of course, we've seen John Morrow, a French mason, uh, coming over yesterday. Well, I'll start um, in hushed tones in an area where I'm not wildly confident about, but I think it's worth at least considering. Uh, one of the possible impacts of Netherlandish architecture in Scotland, I do just wonder if uh, a late medieval taste for having uh, lateral chapels with uh, gables over them could just have been something that was inspired by uh, the Netherlands. Now, do you remember, I'm going to be referring here to uh, one or two of the borough churches and of course, the borough churches, they, the, the borough churches were, were the uh, burgesses of the great trading settlements um, were based. And these were people who were very well able to know what was going on in the Low Countries. Um, here at uh, Edinburgh St Giles, looking at the Albany Isle just here, one of the first additions to uh, the church, the, the chapel there, may that may be the chapel of St John over here, uh, that was perhaps the first edition, but the Albany Isle was built sometime between about 1400 and 1420. And obviously this, this sort of sawtooth effect of the, well, the two gables over the aisle and the third gable over the porch that there was to the west end of the aisle, but clearly that's something where they were trying to make a, a particular effect. You can almost see a little bit of the same thing uh, at Stirling Holy Rood, another of the great trading boroughs, where one chapel just there has a lateral gable like that. Uh, and uh, if you look at the roof line up there on the clear story wall, uh, you can see this chapel also had a lateral gable, a rather taller one. But you know, the only point I'm making is that uh, obviously a taste emerged in the late Middle Ages for this slightly sawtooth effect of lateral gables. Well, I don't want to get carried away with this, uh, but you also must have seen something similar at Elgin Cathedral. Uh, this is a, a rather tatty little sketch that I attempted to give an idea of what the cathedral may have looked like uh, when it was completed. I'm afraid it doesn't bear very close inspection. But we do still have 
these lateral gables over the two surviving uh, upstanding sections of chapel. And I think it is very likely that they extended all the way along the nave aisles. So you know, it was something that really must have been a very prominent feature of the <coughs> nave. Difficult to be certain whether they first date from the post-1270 reconstruction or the post-1390 reconstruction. In their present form, they're certainly post-1390, uh, but I think there is a good chance that they replicate something that was there before. Well, you know, let's not uh, go too far in this, because there was a long tradition of having separately gabled chapels. Uh, Durham Cathedral, for example, in the nave, the gallery, uh, had uh, lateral gables uh, running along it. Uh, you find it in the uh, later th 12th century, at Fountains Abbey in the uh, transept chapels. Think away this extension to the chapel there, which is obviously very much later. Uh, but there you can see you had the uh, sawtooth effect of the gables. And in French rayonon architecture, it became very much a light motif. These are the choir chapels um, at Notre Dame in Paris, uh, which are sometime before about 1271. And again, you can see this effect going along. Not only the chapels themselves, chapel windows have the gables, uh, but the buttresses uh, have small gables, uh, a sort of syncopated rhythm that you get going along. So, you know, there is a long uh, tradition, but the way they're treated in Scotland doesn't look like these. Uh, and to my mind, it looks very much more like the sorts of things that you're getting in the later Middle Ages, when that sort of gable had gone out of fashion in England and France. Uh, this is our shot here. I do apologise, it's such a grim slide, but it's a, a grim picture, but it's taken from a, a slide that I took years ago. But, you know, that sort of treatment of the gables there, I think that looks rather like what you get at Elgin. Uh, and that's first half of the 15th century, uh, around about the same time at Ghent, uh, the Church of San Barbo, um, where the chauvet was completed in about 1430. Well, it never was actually finished. Uh, you can see the chapels were never quite completed. But again, that sort of effect. Uh, and then, of course, you quite often get it on a much larger scale in some churches, like the uh, old church at Amsterdam, where the nave chapels date to about 1470. So, you know, I really don't want to uh, push that too far. But I think it's at least worth considering that people who knew the Low Countries very well, either through trade or ecclesiastical contact, uh, contacts, may well have seen these gables, I thought perhaps it was something they quite like to have uh, in their churches at home, but you know, let's not put it more than that. So please, no nasty questions about that one at the end. Um, I feel on rather more comfortable ground when we start looking at some other details, uh, looking at Aberdeen Cathedral for a start. Uh, we're very fortunate at Aberdeen that we have a, a detailed account of who built the various parts of the uh, cathedral in Hector Boyce's uh, account of the lives of the bishops um, of Aberdeen. Um, and he's on very safe ground when he's talking about things that happened fairly recently. And he tells us that the lower walls of the nave were started by the second bishop of the name of Alexander Kinyon Mund, which would place it between 1355 and 1380. And the earliest part of this, obviously, was the uh, piers of the tower now, it's very confusing getting your bearings here because, of course, the central crossing, the transepts on the choir have all gone. All we have left now, um, upstanding, fully upstanding, is the nave. So this wall here, and the wall that you can see behind there, which is this wall just there, uh, you have to try and think those away in your uh, mind's eye and imagine what this uh, pier must have looked like. And in fact, what it was, uh, you can see it from the other side as well, was an enormous cylindrical core with very large semi-cylindrical shafts on the cardinal axes. And the capitals that receive arches at different levels are themselves all at different levels. So there was no attempt to make the pier um, symmetrical in all directions. And I think that's quite important um, because the only place that I know of where you get piers of that sort um, is in the Brabant. Uh, well, in fact, you do get some slightly further north in the Low Countries, but they seem to have been first introduced in the Brabant area as part of a, uh, a revival of interest in cylindrical piers that you get round about them. And these are, uh, this is uh, an example that you have supporting the West Towers at uh, Saint-Goudoul, uh, or saint michel saint in in Brussels. 
where the West Tower appears date from round about the, fourth, well, the uh, 14th century. We're not really very sure w w quite when. But I hope you'll be able to see that here we have this cylindrical core with the very heavy half shafts in the cardinal axes and the capital is all at different levels depending on where the arch was that they were supporting. And that seems to me to be a very precise prototype for the sort of pier that we have at uh, Aberdeen. And I do think that is um, quite a, a convincing uh, connection. You can see incidentally, of course, that the crossing piers were built uh, before quite a lot of the rest of the nave because the arch, the beginning of the arch was constructed with the piers, but then there's a change that goes with the arcades that run down the uh, rest of the nave. So uh, the original arches go up to about that level there, and then the rest of the arches are part of a, a later campaign. It's just the lower part of the piers uh, of the arcade, apart from the crossing piers, that are part of the uh, first campaign. You do get uh, other examples of this sort of pier um, elsewhere in the Low Countries. This is just a, an example that I happen to have a picture of at Delft, uh, where the tower pier dates to about 1420, um, something like that. Here the shafts on the cardinal axes aren't quite as substantial as the ones that we saw at uh, Brussels, but you know, it is still very much the same sort of spirit. And again, the capital is at the different levels depending on where the uh, arches were. Um, but what about the cylindrical piers that you get in the nave as well? Um, well, there does seem to have been a great revival of interest in cylindrical piers uh, from the 14th century onwards within the Duchy of Brabant. And that's why I was pointing out that there was a coast uh, of Brabant in, at the time that uh, the people who were visiting uh, the Low Countries from Scotland uh, were visiting. And you see particularly in, uh, once again, uh, saint Gudul in Brussels, uh, where the nave piers uh, date from the well, from the early 14th century to the mid 15th century, it was a very long uh, building operation. Uh, but it is possible that the one of the very first examples of this revived in, it revived interest in cylindrical piers was at uh, Mechelen, uh, the Church of Saint Rambou, or Mechelen or Malin, uh, depending on which one you want. And here, the nave piers seem to have been built. Uh, after a fire that uh, destroyed much of the church in 1342. Uh, think away these uh, Baroque images that you get in so many Belgian churches now. You have to just try and imagine the piers uh, standing by themselves. And it does seem to me that there are quite significant parallels between the sort of pier that we're getting here and the sort of pier that we're getting at Aberdeen, uh, which isn't so preposterous when we've seen the very much more precise parallels uh, in the crossing piers and I think what's really considerably, well, very much in common between them is that uh, they're not in extraordinarily tall. Certainly the Netherlandish examples are taller than the Scottish ones. But what strikes me as particularly significant is that there's a very clear distinction between the arch and the pier. There was also a, a certain amount of renewed interest in cylindrical piers in France from the uh, early 15th century. But there, the arches tend to be treated much more what you call prismatically. You don't have this flat soffit to the arch in the way that you tend to have in both the Low Countries uh, and in Scotland. So if we're looking for continental origins, I think it is much more convincing to look to the uh, Low Countries. And for me, um, the church that uh, convinces me, of, well, I don't know about convinces me, I'm not sure I never, the longer I live, the less able I, I am to convince myself of, of things. Uh, but the one that seems to me to do, perhaps have the strongest argument uh, is Dunkeld, uh, where we know from Abbot Milne's account of the lives of the bishops that Dunkeld was started by Bishop Robert de Cardiny in 1406. Uh, and here in the nave, we have relatively early examples of cylindrical piers. It is sometimes suggested that these uh, a part of a Romanesque revival. And, you know, there certainly could have been consciousness of the fact that peers of this sort had had a prehistory in Scotland. Uh, you know, I, I was talking yesterday about how there was a revival of interest in early form. So, you know, that could have created a climate that was receptive to the reuse of this sort of peers. But it's when you look at the details that you see this is completely and utterly late medieval. You know, this is a, a, a base that simply could not have existed before the very early 15th century. Uh, basically, what you have is an octagonal sub-base uh, with uh, a circular upper part of the sub-base, then a vertical section, 
and then uh, a circular base itself corresponding to the piers. And you know, that does seem to me to tie in very much with the sort of piers that you're seeing in the Netherlands, Netherlands examples of this sort of pier, just showing you Delft a bit <coughs> further up the coast from the places that we've been talking about, where, you know, again, you have this uh, octagonal sub-base. Uh, here, the lower part of the base itself is also octagonal, uh, but then the circular base itself with buildings that are basically OG curves. Uh, you know, of course there are differences between those two, uh, not only in scale, but in detailing. Uh, but I don't think that sort of base uh, is possible, as I say, before the 15th century. And I think it is very possible that it was looking at things like this that made that uh, more acceptable. Well, let's go back to uh, Aberdeen for just a little while. Just a quick look at the uh, West Front, which I think really is one of the noblest things that we have in Scotland. It is an extraordinary piece of design, one of the most robust pieces of architecture that you'll get anywhere, uh, with two towers that look like tower houses with machicolated parapets at the top as well. Mm -hmm. The spires are slightly later added by um, Bishop uh, Dunbar, uh, but the low part of the front, well, it was certainly all started for Bishop Ale Alexander Kinnemund. And this wonderful treatment of these, this series of equal height, tall, round-headed windows, that is really, you know, nothing... Um, I wish uh, that uh, an assault of cinema that I used to have to go past on my way into Sheffield when I was young didn't have rather similar Art Deco windows in uh, over the entrance. Uh, but that, you know, that is an absolutely wonderful piece of... Uh, design uh, and considering that it's built of granite which is a very intractable material they really are overcoming the difficulties of working the granite very successfully indeed but I just wanted to show you the uh, the west door here uh, the mountains are very simplified because it's all of uh, granite but this treatment with uh, a round arch with the two uh, pointed sub arches uh, within it um, I think again that's just possibly something that may have uh, drawn its inspiration from the Netherlands. Uh, just look at something, go back to St. Salvatore, where we were looking at the, uh, the choir stalls earlier on. This is the door of the North Transept, which may have been started in the late 13th century, although more likely perhaps to be early 14th century, probably not all that long before the door at Aladdin. But the way you have this round arch with these two pointed arches set within it, here you also, of course, have these lintels and the uh, image niches uh, within their spandrels as well, but um, I think it's certainly possible that it may have been from something like uh, St. Salvatore that the idea from Aberdeen was taken. And I think we're going to see that even more clearly um, at a couple of churches that I, I now want to move on to, where um, I think it would be very difficult indeed to understand the buildings without assuming that there was really quite a strong element of drawing inspiration from the Netherlands. This is the church of uh, Dundee St. Mary. Um, only the tower, of course, survives from the medieval church, but it probably is the finest tower that was built in medieval Scotland. It's rather a shame that it's now backed onto by a rather bleak looking shopping centre and people tend not to look at it very closely. But this is an absolutely wonderful tower that really deserves very close uh, inspection indeed. And it seems to be the last element in an extending building uh, program uh, that uh, began probably in about uh, 1443 uh, when agreement was reached with the Abbey of Lindores, the body that had appropriated uh, Dundee uh, over the rebuilding of the choir. And uh, building seems to have progressed from the east end of the choir, which was the part to be built first, to the transepts, into the nave, and finally the tower. And I think the tower was almost certainly nearing completion by 1495, when a bell was donated. Uh, that might not strike you as very firm uh, evidence for the date of a tower, but people on the whole didn't like to give things to building programs until there was a reasonable chance that they were going to be put in use. So if you were giving a bell, you wanted to know that somebody was going to start ringing that bell, hopefully in your own lifetime. So I think that is quite a good pointer to when the tower was finished. Um, but this tower, well, I suppose the most characteristic, the most defining feature of it is this rather telescope design. The way the upper stories are set back within the lower stories behind this parapet uh, that's punctuated by uh, a series of uh, pinnacles. Well, that's a type of tower that you get everywhere in the uh, low countries. 
The grandfather of all of them was the massive uh, West Tower of Utrecht Cathedral, which now stands in isolation since the nave has been uh, destroyed. But the lower parts of this tower were built between 1321, about 1321 and 1382. Uh, but I hope you'll be able to see that, uh, obviously this is a, a much more excavated piece of masonry, but I hope you'll be able to see that there is quite a lot in common between these two, particularly when you look at the way the upper stories are set back within the lower, this tracery parapet with the pinnacles punctuating it. Uh, but I think it's much more likely that the uh, Burgesses of Dundee were looking elsewhere in the Netherlands, and there was a whole series of towers that they could have uh, looked to. Uh, this is one at Amarongen, which is perhaps slightly later than um, the one at um, uh, the, the tower at Dundee. But I'm just showing as, uh, as an example of uh, a group of towers of all very similar type. And I hope again you'll see you know, basically the same sort of approach the telescoped upper story, the balustraded parapet, uh, sorry, the tracery parapet that's punctuated by pinnacles. And really, I just cannot see that the design of uh, the Tower of Dundee would have been possible without a knowledge of this group of towers here. And I'll come back in a little while to look at more of the details of that. But I now want to move on to another church, which I think shows uh, the inspiration, uh, the, the evidence of inspiration from the Low Countries, and that's the Church of Haddington St Mary. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, rebuilding here started in 1462 with the choir, when agreement was reached over uh, rebuilding the uh, choir with St Andrew's Cathedral Priory, and I doubt if the West Front had been reached very much before uh, 1500. Um, you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going into the details of the argument of why it is, although if you want to hang on later, I'll, I'll certainly run through them with you. Um, but there are details in the windows to either side which support such a late date. But interestingly, um, in the great parish churches in Scotland, we don't have very much of a tradition of West Front design. You know, if you think of something like Edinburgh St Giles, uh, which is another example of a church with a central tower, where you needed a West Front. There was never really a West Front at uh, St Giles before the 19th century. The entrances were by two porches to either side. No particular emphasis was given to the West Front at all. And you almost get the feeling that at Haddington, a new approach to design had to be uh, worked out. And I think the really significant features are, well, first of all, this door at the bottom, a round arch with two round arches inside it. Then immediately above it, this enormous great window, but inset from the buttresses to either side. And a particularly important feature about this window is these two massive sub-arches within the field of tracery. Um, you, know, you usually do have a hierarchy of forms within window tracery, but these are just so enormous um, that they, they stand out as something different. And then at the top of the uh, wall head, you have the gable set back behind this tracery parapet uh, just there. Well, um, you have something rather similar in the West Front at Dundee as well, which uh, makes me think that these two buildings are very closely uh, related. Again, you've got this round arch door with the, actually it's a rather crushed round arch, uh, with the two round arches to the doors themselves. And then you have this great window set in a little bit to either side from the buttresses um, with this pair of massive sub-arches um, subdividing the tracery field. And uh, when you look at the details of the door, for example, um, those are very similar um, between the two uh, buildings. Um, obviously, differences of detail. I'm not suggesting the same masons were involved. Um, but I hope you'll agree that they are very similar. It's very unfortunate that the foliage carving at Dundee was given a working over in, I think it was the 1960s, and now it bears absolutely no relationship whatever to uh, what had been there before. Um, very happily at uh, Haddington, the foliage survives extraordinarily well. And in fact, it is very high quality uh, foliage carving. So those two doors suggest that there is a link between uh, the two buildings. And um, I think the ultimate source for that sort of design is any number of doors that you would come across in the Low Countries. They tend to be more richly decorated in the Low Countries. Uh, here, this is a doorway in Utrecht Cathedral in the South Transept. 
which is datable to about 1440 to 1480. Uh, it's not very precisely dated. And here you have the sort of blind tracery in the tympanum. And you could go very, very much further than that. This is Leyden St. Pancras uh, of about 1500. And here, you know, you can see you've got drop cusping, uh, you have an OG uh, flipped hood molding, and then, of course, you have the, uh, the tracery in the tympanum as well. But the basic form of the door, the two round arches embraced by, carried on a trumo, and embraced by a, a larger round arch, it, it is basically the same that we've been seeing at uh, Dundee and Haddington. And then when we go on to, uh, oh, sorry, I thought, uh, yes, um, the links with the Low Countries, I think, become rather more clear when you look at the overall design of the West Front at Haddington. Um, just comparing with something like, say, the transept at uh, Dordrecht, um, obviously this wasn't the main entrance front, so the door isn't on quite the same scale. Uh, but look at this window here, set back from the buttresses on either side, massive uh, sub-arches within the tracery field, gable set back behind this tracery parapet at the top, an awful lot of the same elements as we see at Haddington. Uh, but I think probably one of the closest comparisons uh, was where I spent four days of my 25th wedding anniversary here in Bruges. Uh, my wife was uh, so excited when we found that the fragmentary remains of the church were just at the end of the road where our hotel was. Uh, you, you wouldn't believe me if I told you how happy it made her. Um, um, but here you've got um, you know, a lot of the elements that we're looking at at uh, Haddington. The round arch door, uh, other views show that these are round arched uh, openings to the door itself, uh, carried on a trumo. Uh, the door, uh, sorry, the window uh, subdivided by massive sub arches. There's probably been a parapet there, because you can see the gable is actually set back, but it's gone now. But there is a parapet at the base of the west window. So, you know, on that evidence, uh, I think it, there is a strong case to be made that both Haddington and Dundee were looking to the Netherlands for their ideas. And when you start looking at the window tracery uh, again, this use of the, the massive sub-arches is something that you find particularly in the Netherlands, first of all, in churches built of brick. Uh, brick, of course, was one of the main building materials in the Netherlands, and it was quite difficult to construct windows uh, out of brick. Uh, and so things like sub-arches tended to be very much more robust than they were uh, elsewhere. And you get the sort of tracery that, uh, very much simplified tracery that I'll be talking about. But I think it's that sort of sub-arch there that you see in the window at Haddington and also in uh, several other places. I'm just giving you the example of Seton Collegiate Church where you have something rather similar there. So there, there do seem to be quite good reasons for seeing uh, connections with the uh, Low Countries. I think that's probably very much the case with another set of windows in St. Andrews. I, I do keep reverting to St. Andrews, but this is the fragment of the Dominican church in St. Andrews, uh, a small polygonal apse projecting on the north side of the church. And this has got that very simplified tracery that I was talking about in the last slide, where you can see it's made in the uh, Netherlandish examples, it's made up of brick, and cusping was quite difficult to achieve. It, it was sometimes achieved, but you tend to end up with these rather loose, loop-like forms. And that's what you're getting uh, here at uh, St. Andrews. And I think the sort of windows that they were probably looking at were things, you know, I'm not suggesting a di direct link with a tiny little church like uh, Capella in, uh, in the county of Holland, dating from the late 15th century, but I hope you'll be able to see that these windows are very, very like uh, what you've got um, at, in the Dominican church at St. Andrews. And that's not such a far-fetched uh, comparison because um, the Dominican province of Scotland had a visitation from the province of Holland, after which in 1510, John Adamson was appointed head of the Dominicans in, uh, in Scotland. And he does seem to have taken a lot of his ideas from what was happening in Holland. And I think it's really quite possible that he may have been aware of the architecture of some of the Dominican churches in Holland as well. Um, we're not entirely sure of the date of this. I've uh, said sometime after 1516, that's when money left by Bishop William Elphinstone was allocated, allocated to uh, the building of the Dominican church here. But it could have been as late as 1525, uh, because 
permission was given in that year to encroach on the pavement at St Andrews. So uh, it could have been an addition that was, uh, that was made then. Um, have a look at one or two other examples of this sort of loose loop-like tracery. One of my great favourites is the Church of uh, Mid Calder in West Lothian. Uh, it's an absolutely lovely church. Um, it was uh, rebuilt by the rector of the church, uh, Peter Sandilands, who was a member of the local landholding family. And he built a burial vault and a vestry at the East End, which you can't actually see, it's behind those trees there. And he was terrified that he was getting so old he'd never finish his church. So he bound his nephew and great-nephew to complete the church and provided the money for it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the younger generations uh, went over to the Reformed Church, and in fact it never was finished. So this was the only part that was built in the Middle Ages. But I hope you'll be able to see that it's got this sort of um, very simplified loop-like tracery with no cusping um, in the figures uh, that I've been talking about at St Andrews and other places as well. And just simply for uh, a comparison, um, I'm just showing you the part of the Oak Church at Delft, uh, where you can see uh, related tracery. I wouldn't want to put it closer than that. In fact, this tracery is probably closer to what we saw at um, the Dominican Church in St Andrews rather than Mid Calder. Um, but I, it does seem to be, sh be showing the dissemination of these ideas. And you get something of the same kind at King's College Aberdeen, uh, which was started for Bishop William Elphinstone um, in 1500. He was obviously planning his work for some time before then, because in 1495 he was given permission to found a, a Studium Generale, which is uh, essentially a, a medieval university, uh, and that's when he started collecting his wheelbarrows and gunpowder as well. Um, but the church itself is supposed to be founded in 1500, and there's a foundation inscription just there. Although that inscription is cut into the stone, which suggests it's secondary, and it has been suggested that in fact the 1500 date was more a wish to establish a link with the foundation of the Temple of Solomon. I must have been, I've never quite followed the argument myself, but uh, I think it, uh, it probably is uh, quite a plausible uh, argument. The basic design of King's College, I think, was almost certainly uh, drawn from St. Salvatore's in St. Andrews. It's a rectangular church with a polygonal eastern apse. It has a tower at one corner. Uh, it did have a two-storied range running along the south side, uh, which contained the treasury uh, and the sacristy. Uh, St. Andrews almost certainly had one on the north side, but all the elements are the same. Uh, but as I was saying yesterday, there are elements that seem to look to England. Uh, ultimately, the crown steeple, although it had been naturalised in Scotland by then, and of course also the little steeple or flesh that was built by John Burwell or John Burnell. But I think an awful lot of the details of the work are in fact inspired by what there was in the Netherlands. And um, Elphinstone was somebody who was very well placed to know uh, Netherlandish uh, buildings. Um, in 1495, it was, goodness me, it was a busy year for him, uh, he was in Bruges on an embassy, uh, a marriage embassy, uh, for uh, James IV, uh, and while he was there, he was asked to depute for the Bishop of Tournai at uh, very important uh, celebrations. So, you know, he was obviously somebody who had a presence um, in Bruges and would know what was, uh, what was going on. And... I think there probably are Netherlandish influences, particularly in the design of the windows. Here what we've got is a central mullion rising right up through the window to the apex of the arch. You see this arch is basically round as well. And then you have this rather uh, almost flaccid uh, grouping of uh, mouchettes or dagger forms through the tracery field. But the real interesting feature is the very heavy central mullion. Well, you do get central mullions in a number of churches, but not treated with that sort of weight. And some years ago, well, many years ago, over a century, in fact, um, Macpherson pointed out similarities with, say, the church of Saint-Jacques at Liège, where in this transept window here, you can see this central mullion, not quite as heavy as the one that we've got at um, Aberdeen. Uh, but in other respects, I don't think this window really does relate to Aberdeen particularly closely. And it's also later than um, the window at uh, Aberdeen. Uh, it must have been built between 1513 and 1533 by the master mason Arnold uh, van Malken, uh, 
Um, to my mind, I think there are probably rather closer parallels with this window uh, at Utrecht Cathedral. This is in the Don Prosten Chapel, which is uh, fairly uh, precisely dated to, having said fairly precisely, to about 1497. Um, so it is conceivable that it uh, would have been designed at the time that um, uh, Elphinstone was in the Netherlands. But I do think what you've got here with this uh, reasonably strong vertical mullion and this rather loose um, aggregation of loop-like forms is, is not all that dissimilar from uh, the West Window at uh, Aberdeen. Uh, but all I'm saying is that I, I think the Aberdeen window is more comprehensible if you take account of windows of that kind. And also, when you start looking at the ceiling inside the uh, chapel, this is the ceiling here. Um, it, there's been a certain amount of restoration to it, but it is still basically uh, okay. And we know that it was almost identical to the ceiling that there was over uh, the uh, parish church um, of St. Nicholas in Aberdeen, in, in New Aberdeen, as opposed to Old Aberdeen, where the King's College is. But you know, just have a look, you've got this uh, barrel ceiling, boarded barrel ceiling, rather depressed, rounded profile. Uh, you've got a pattern of ribs, um, essentially imitating four-part or, or quadripartite vaulting. You know, you've got the ribs between the bays, the transverse ribs, and then you have the diagonal ribs crossing over in the middle of each bay. But the most significant feature is this sort of boss that you have at the junction of the ribs, where you have these very widely spreading uh, foliage sprigs, and you have that in both churches. It's slightly simpler here at uh, Aberdeen. But at Aberdeen, we know that the roof uh, was con contracted for um, by uh, John Fender, who uh, did quite a lot of work around Aberdeen. Um, the contract is for the roof, but I suspect it probably meant the uh, ceiling as well. Uh, and um, Elphinstone took a very close interest in St. Nicholas, um, and so if he was involved in the choice of Fender to put the ceiling on, I think it's perfectly possible that Fender was also responsible for the ceiling as well. They are very similar indeed. Well, what's the source of the design? Um, well, of course, in some ways, it's rather like the ribbed pointed barrel vaults that I was showing you yesterday. This is the vault over St. Mirren's Isle. Um, slightly confusing because it does have these intersections over the 13th century arches from the transept. But you know, basically, this is a pointed barrel vault with ribs set out on a pretty similar pattern to what we see at, uh, at Aberdeen. So you know, would that explain it? Um, and of course, once the Aberdeen ceiling was painted, or lime washed and painted, it wouldn't have looked very different from the ceiling, although the ribs, of course, would have looked very much more uh, slender. However, the problem is the bosses that I was talking about, and these do seem to be Netherlandish. Um, you start getting them in the town hall ceiling in Bruges. This is a uh, work by Jean de Valenciennes of 1402. Uh, the sprigs here are rather more uh, robust. Um, but maybe it's at the beginning of a tradition which was going to continue for quite some time. And uh, perhaps even more significant is um, a ceiling, well, a whole series of ceilings in St. Giles Church in Bruges. And I hope you'll remember that I said St. Giles, at St. Giles Church is where uh, a number of Scottish communities had altars or chapels. So this would certainly have been known to uh, Scots uh, living in uh, Bruges. And here you do have uh, quite similar uh, sprigged bosses uh, projecting out from the, well, the circular bosses at the intersections. You don't have the quadripartite or four-part pattern of ribs, though, that you have at Aberdeen. Although in other places uh, in the Netherlands, you do have this. This is uh, one of a number of ceilings in the uh, Beelicke uh, nunnery in Ghent, uh, which date from about 1330 where you do have this uh, intersecting pattern of ribs. So, um, you know, can we come to a, any sort of conclusion on that? My own feeling is that uh, basically it's a ceiling that was designed by somebody who knew uh, um, a whole range of ceilings in the Netherlands, um, but it was also very much in tune with the tradition of vaulting design in Scotland. And this is an example of the sort of thing that I've been trying to stress was beginning to happen that master masons and patrons didn't just copy things wholesale um, in the way that perhaps things in England had been copied wholesale in the early 12th century. Uh, you know, it was a question that they took what they liked and they were sophisticated enough to bring it together into a synthesized design.
And I think what we're seeing at uh, King's College uh, is an example of this. Well, having started this session with something uh, in which I wasn't sure I felt an awful lot of confidence, uh, I'm going to end with something in which I probably feel even less confidence. Uh, I want to just have a quick look at, uh, I do like ending with tombs. Um, this is probably the most ambitious tomb that was ever built uh, in Scotland. Uh, it's the tomb of uh, Bishop James Kennedy uh, in St. Salvatore's Chapel. Uh, he died in 1465, but I think it is possible that the tomb was started well before then, uh, possibly being built along with the chapel itself, which I'm sure you've all remembered was started in uh, 1450. I'm sure I didn't have to tell you that. Um, but this is his tomb, and it's on the north side of the presbytery area. So, as I've said before, it was almost certainly intended to be used as an Easter sepulchre as well as a tomb. And in fact, the interesting thing about this tomb is that there's very little evidence of it actually being used as a tomb. Um, I can promise you that I've had one of my colleagues at St Andrews lie down in it, so it is long enough to take an effigy. Uh, but there's absolutely no trace of uh, an effigy within it. And I think that slab probably never was intended to have uh, an effigy on it. Um, one point about that uh, slab is that it's almost certainly made of Tournay marble, what was known in the Middle Ages as touch. Uh, so that's something that was imported from the uh, Low Countries. But an awful lot of the design of this tomb isn't quite what you'd expect for something that was purely a tomb. Those of you who haven't been do have a look at the delightful detailing that you get in the carving round here. Uh, it does remind me tremendously of a doll's house that I made for my daughter when never let her play with it, of course. Uh, it has lovely uh, staircases heading off in, uh, through hidden doorways. You know, there really is this feeling that you're trying to create something which is anticipating the heavenly kingdom. It's terribly badly eroded now, and it was very damaged when the stone vault over the chapel fell down, but you can still see that this has been an absolute stunner. And I do think it's very possible that this is where the, uh, there are references in the inventories of the chapel to there being uh, an Easter sepulchre, which was obviously a movable item. And I'm fairly sure that it would have been placed in state on that stone slab there. And this tabernacle work going around the middle was probably intended to focus attention onto that um, uh, Easter sepulchre. But what about this tabernacle work that rises uh, on the top? Now, I've spent ages and ages and ages trying to find parallels for it, and it is very difficult. You know, this is some of the most extraordinary micro-architectural tabernacle work that you'll find anywhere. It's lovely to spend ages just exploring it. An awful lot is missing, but you know, it's very much two-dimensional, so that you have spaces beyond spaces. But it seems to me a particular characteristic of it is that it ends very much on a horizontal line. Parts do rise above that horizontal line, but it, end, it is very much ending on that horizontal line. Uh, and it has a sort of little tracery parapet going along the top. Not much of it survives, but when you look closely, you can see that it's still there. But that's not something you usually get in uh, microarchitecture. Um, but I had a, a bit of a Paul on the road to Damascus experience the other day when I was looking through a book on uh, alterettables um, produced in uh, the Low Country, well, in, in Holland and uh, Belgium. Uh, and I came across a group of uh, altarpieces, um, all of which originate in Brussels, uh, where you have a very similar, well, it seems to me very similar treatment of these rows of. Uh, convex tabernacle work with you know one plane of open work set in front of another. As I say, a lot of it's been lost on this, but ending on the top with that traceried uh, parapet, uh, very much on a horizontal line. And that's I, it's this group of uh, altarpieces uh, made in Brussels. These are the only ones that I've been able to come across of this kind. You know, you're almost left wondering if did uh, Saint Salvator have an altar, one of these altarpieces within it, and was it possible that the tomb of Kennedy took some of its ideas from it? I really don't know. And uh, you know, by tomorrow, I may not be quite so enthusiastic about the uh, idea of the interrelationship, but I have to say at the moment, uh, it does seem to me uh, a possible um, connection. Uh, just note, by the way, that this altarpiece is in the Priory Church of Ambiel, 
Uh, and you remember that that was the small, I'm sure you'll remember, that was the small prior church that I showed you when I was trying to explain just why uh, Trinity College Chapel in Edinburgh uh, looked the way that it did. So, you know, we do have a whole series of interconnections in this way. Anyway, sorry, I'm two minutes late, but we'll stop there and uh, see those of you who can stay the course for the last talk in half an hour's time. Thank you.